here we go. Before we get started, uh, we should just thank our sponsors. Obviously, events like these can't happen without our sponsors. So, Patch My PC and Chocolatey are outside in the lobby. Well, actually, I think they're in other rooms right now. Uh, but we'll be in the lobby giving away swag, talking about their products. Uh, they're, they're all great people, so stop by, say hello, thank them. This is me. Uh, my name is Jess Pomfret. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm a data platform architect at Data Masterminds. Uh, I'm also an open source contributor, and I've contributed to DBA Tools, DBA Checks, and I've written a couple of resources for the SQL Server DSC module. I'm passionate about SQL Server, PowerShell, and proper football. I put proper football because I lived in America for a while, which is why my accent is really weird. Apologies there. Uh, and they would argue that football is this like hand egg thing, so I had to specify that it was proper football I was into. The most important thing on this slide is my contact details. If you've got questions after the fact or you want to get in contact, my email address, uh, and I'm on LinkedIn. I'm kind of on Twitter, but I haven't really been very active there recently. And I'm trying Mastodon, and I'm not really sure how I feel about it. So LinkedIn is pretty safe. Email is definitely safe. So today we're going to talk about DBA tools, uh, what it is. We'll probably skip the PowerShell 101. I'm guessing most of you have done PowerShell before. I talk a lot to database professionals, and they have no idea about PowerShell. So I like to tell them how they get the module, how they get it installed, that kind of stuff. And then I've got these six life hacks. Now, this is a 45-minute session where 15 minutes of it is supposed to be for questions. So we probably don't have time for six life hacks. So we're going to do a choose-your-own-adventure. If there's something particular you want to see out of these sections, uh, we'll hit that first, and then we'll go through and kind of discuss. Gail's at the back, so we're definitely not going to break the rules. But we may do questions as we go for each section rather than 15 minutes at the end. So if you've got questions, just interrupt me, and we'll kind of keep it uh, interactive. So what is DBA Tools? DBA Tools is an open source PowerShell module. And if you've, if you've interacted with SQL Server, you've probably used SQL Server Management Studio. And DBA Tools is like a command line version of that tool. It's great for handling multiples, right? Management Studio is great. You can go in, you can look at your databases, you can check your properties, you can check your logins. It's very much like one at a time, though. It's easy to check one database. With DBA Tools, we can say, tell me about all of the databases on many instances across my entire estate. It's also MIT licensed, which is a short and simple license. Basically, you keep the copyright intact. You can use it for whatever you want. And that means that we can use it at work. We can use it in our side projects. You can use it wherever. I also like to point out the security factor. And I've got a, uh, a link that I'll share later on uh, to a blog post that goes through all this. But we put a lot of effort into being secure, right? When you take a PowerShell module into your enterprise, into your, into your company, the first thing you're going to do is get over this hurdle of trying to get it in, right? Pass the security team, like, yes, it's open source. Yes, it's from GitHub or the PowerShell gallery, but it's safe. So the module is code signed, which means if you pull it down from the PowerShell gallery and you interrogate that certificate, if it's intact, you're good to go. You know that the code that you've downloaded is the code that we've pushed up there. We've also got pester tests. This is a community module, right? And tons of us are making changes. And like, I've got a really great new feature, and I'm going to put it in, but oh, it broke all this stuff. We've got pester tests that run. There's about 600 of them. Anytime you commit some code, it makes sure that you didn't break the existing functionality. And with new, uh, new contributions, we ask that those pester tests are written for like, new functionality, too, so that someone comes along. Your new code, your functions aren't broken either. We've also got branch policies, which is like a whole day session by itself, probably. But basically, we restrict who can push to the main branch, which then ends up on PowerShell Gallery. There's about three people uh, that can actually push to that branch and cause a new module to be released. A short history, and I'm going to skip most of this. But the point here is it, DBA Tools has been around for a while at this point. It was started in 2015. Uh, we had the 1.0 release in 2019, and coming soon, like working in progress right now, is the 2.0 release, which includes uh, new SMO, uh, a, a pretty much overhaul of the module, splitting out the DLLs from the main module, which is going to make it much easier to maintain going forward, and some new stuff. Replication is hoping to be involved in either 2.0 or like a release soon after that, uh, and many more things. The last stable release that we have at the moment is 1.1.145, and there are 533 commands in there that you can use to interact with your databases, 
with your logins, with your SQL estate. We've also got a book. Uh, I was lucky enough to be one of the authors of the book, but there is Learn DBA Tools in a Month of Lunches. This format I really love. I use that format for when I learned PowerShell, the Learn PowerShell in a Month of Lunches, and it's basically like 30 small chapters where you can take them on on your lunch break, learn something new every day, and after 30 days, you're feeling pretty good about the subject. That is all of the slides. Oh, boy. And that was the demos done, too. Uh, so we're going to hop into VS Code, which I'm sure you've seen plenty today. Uh, is it big enough at the back? Can you see the text OK? Cool, great. So as I mentioned, uh, PowerShell. How many people have used PowerShell before? Yeah, how many people have used a community module, have downloaded something from PS Gallery and used it, right? Cool. If you need a re recap, you can download this. Uh, this is all on my GitHub. This runs you through how to get the module. Uh, the only interesting thing I've got in here is, as I mentioned, 2.0 is coming out. To get that, you need to allow pre-release, and that gets you the pre-release preview module. All right, so we've got a voting time. We've got backups. We've got logins. We've got database snapshots. We've got migrations. We've got best practices or everyone's favorite documentation. Any takers? Snapshots. snapshots. All right, let's start there. So database snapshots, I think these are pretty cool. But to be honest, they get a bit of a rough, uh, a rough reputation, because Management Studio doesn't do a great job of it letting you interact with them. But DBA Tools does. And we can use DBA Tools to take snapshots uh, and then be able to roll back changes and stuff. So with DBA Tools, all of our naming conventions, uh, we're going to use DBA, so new DBA is going to create something, right? And we've got a snapshot here. We've got a SQL instance, and we've got a database. And we can create a snapshot just like that. You'll see that you get some output returned. One of the other things that's really great, uh, great with DBA tools is the output is all pretty standard. And we should probably plug this in before we run out of power mid-presentation. One second, folks. Nothing but professional here. Great. OK, so with DBA tools, we get this kind of standard output. We're going to see the same uh, kind of format coming back. We're going to often see computer name, instance name, SQL instance. I think these come back on pretty much every command so that you know how to interact and you start to feel familiar with the code. So we've now created this database snapshot, which is a read-only copy of your database at a, t at a point in time, that point that we took the snapshot. And the way this works is it's a sparse file. So any changes to my database are actually put into that sparse file, right? So if I need to recreate what it looked like at that point in time, we take those changes and we can merge them back in, or we can just interrogate the snapshot looking at what it looked like at that point of time. You can see at the moment it is zero bytes. There's nothing in there. I'm using a hash table here to uh, keep track of SQL instance and database. I can pass that same. Uh, hash table using splatting to get DBA DB snapshot. This is going to list all of the database snapshots for the Northwind database on that instance. If I pass in more instances, if I pass in more databases, I'll get all of the snapshots for those, right? All right, this is the fun bit. We're going to go make some rogue changes. So I've got my AdventureWorks database. We did not take a snapshot of AdventureWorks. We took a snapshot of Northwind. That would go really poorly. Do we have AdventureWorks on here? We do not. OK. You can see on the left, I've got Northwind, and I've got the Northwind, which is my database snapshot. In Management Studio, this shows up in a separate node called Database Snapshots. This is Azure Data Studio. What we can do is we can go in here. Let's take a look at our employees table. We've got employees data in here. And we can do something like this. Let's go ahead. Have we got phone number? We do. Let me grab this from the snapshots. Oh, that's showing the database snapshots. Hold on. OK. So we've got phone number in this table. Let's type on the fly. What could go wrong here? So if I update my database, I'm updating my employees table. 
And I'm going to say set phone, home phone number equal to 330-329-6691. Okay. And then I'm not really concentrating. I press run, and I'm like, oh, my, I've updated all of the rows in my database. All of my employees now have a phone number that I used to have. Not ideal, right? You can see that the phone number in my actual database has all been updated to uh, the same one. It's, it's a mistake. Bad things have happened. We can also just drop tables, right? If I do drop table region, oops. Oh, it's referenced by a foreign key. I've got to get the one at the bottom. Let's do order details. OK, the table's gone. If I refresh this, you can now see I've got no order details table. OK, so not only have I dropped a table that we needed, I've also updated one with all the wrong information. But the nice thing is with snapshots, we still have that information, right? If I review my uh, snapshots, it still says it's got zero bytes. So we haven't made many changes. We haven't made enough changes to make a difference, really. Let's go ahead and check if we've got any processes running. So we've got two processes running against the Northwind database right now, uh, coming from my laptop, coming from uh, Azure Data Studio. I can use get DBA process and like regular PowerShell, like a lot of commands. We support piping on a lot of things. So I can pipe that straight to stop DBA process. What that's going to do is kill the sessions, right? If you look up a, se a session ID in, in Management Studio and you do kill uh, spit ID, that's exactly what we just did. But I didn't have to go through and grab a map of who was active and do the kill on each line. You can just pipe it straight through. So now what we can do is we can say restore DBA DB snapshot. And that'll restore my snapshot. If we go back to Azure Data Studio and we select from our employees table, we should see that the home phone numbers have now all been restored. Now, obviously, I killed the processes that were touching that, right? That is pretty intrusive. And I mean, if we've got a big data problem, like someone dropped a table, or we've messed up all of the home phone numbers, maybe that's OK. We can take a quick downtime. We roll back. But for home phone numbers, like, am I really causing a production outage? Maybe I just need to update those phone numbers. What I can actually do is I can select them straight from uh, straight from the snapshot. Because it's a read-only copy, I could come in here, grab my employee data, and you can see it's a select statement just from the snapshot name. And if I scroll to the right, you can see the home phone numbers have restored, uh, are, are the correct ones, because this is in the snapshot, right? So instead of restoring the whole snapshot, what I could actually do is get this data and kind of smush it back into the real table, right? Join on the, on the ID column and update the table that's been affected in prod. Yes, we've got the wrong data there for a couple seconds, but we're not having to take a whole downtime to roll that database back. It basically depends on what you need, right? There's two situations for restoring data from snapshots. Uh, restore the whole thing or use this kind of piecemeal approach. When we're done with our snapshots, it's important to clean them up. As I mentioned, they're sparse files. So if you leave them on your production databases and they're busy, they're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. If they run out of space, they just kind of break. Your, your actual production database will be OK, but that snapshot will just give up, give up on life. Uh, and you won't be able to get any of the data back from it. So be a little bit con uh, conscious of how, how big that could grow. If you change every byte in your database, that snapshot's going to match the size of your database, right? So just something to think about. We're done breaking things for today. So we can take get DBA DB snapshot, and we can pipe it through to the remove command. I've said confirm false. Trust me, it's fine. And I've dropped that snapshot. So that is database snapshots and how we can use them. I really like this for kind of application upgrades. So if you've got a third party application that's going to run uh, against your database, and they're going to do this upgrade, and you don't know exactly what it's going to run, I create a quick snapshot, run the upgrade. And if something goes wrong, one of their updates fails, or it leaves the database in a bad state, you've got this kind of quick fallback. Um, if it's a big database, an actual database restore can take hours, right? Whereas this restore of the snapshot is just going to put the changes back. So it's pretty neat. Any questions on snapshots? Can you control where the snapshot lives? I don't think so. I think it goes to the data file. Uh, drive to the default. What we can do, though, is if we do this, 
Uh, all of the DBA tools commands have really good help with them. And if we do full, we should be able to see if there's a parameter for path. There is a parameter for path, okay. Is there no example? Interesting. Why doesn't it tell me the help? Well, it didn't tell me about it, though, did it? It just, they've got no examples. I'm missing part of the help. None. I wonder if that's, so I just uploaded my demos. What you should do the day before a demo is to use the preview version of DBA tools, right? So I wonder if there's an issue with getting the help on this, on this version of the module. Interesting. Let's do this real quick. If I do get module DBA tools list available, we can see that I've got them all over the place. Bit of a mess. Don't judge. And I can get in the specific version I want, right? So I'll grab this 11333. And then if we do git help new DBA DB snapshot. And I'm in Windows now, not in the containers that I'm running in VS Code. So I can use uh, this. And yeah, OK, creates files, uh, snapshots, and stores the files under the snapshot. So you're right, yeah, path can be used to direct the snapshot files to where you want them. So that's a good point, actually, because if we're concerned with space and our data drives, log drives haven't got enough space, ah, oh, we could instead direct them somewhere else. Yeah, good question. I learned something. Yeah, it will still be a database snapshot, so it will still show up, but just the files, like the MDF, LDF of the database are going to be somewhere else, yeah. Yeah. It will still attach it and look like a real database, yeah. Cool. Good question. Any other questions on snapshots? All right. Anyone have a next chapter they want to visit? We've got backups. Let's do uh, logins and extracts. Log logins. All right, cool. So this one's pretty cool, and I use this really often. Uh, managing logins and access with DBA tools. As I mentioned, it's really good for handling multiples, right? We'll run through an example here of how we can set up permissions for a server. But in the back of your mind, just be thinking about this is an example for one. But like, how can I use this for many? So the first thing we need to do when we want to assign permissions to SQL Server is to add a login, right? So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and use new DBA login to add the JSP SQL login to my instance. I'm using a secure password. That's a PS credential, uh, secure string, sorry. And I'm going to pass that in to create my login. So in Management Studio, that's basically created my login. I've got public access to, to no, no databases, no access to anything, right? I then need to do new DBA DB user, which is creating that JSP user within the database admin. So now I have public access to that database admin database. Still no read access, still no write access. None of the other checkboxes underneath that are checked, just the database checkbox. So then I can give myself DB data reader, so read access to the database. And I'm using add DBA DB role member for that. The parameters I'm specifying are just for a one single SQL instance, one single user, one single database, one single role, right? But all of those can take multiples. There's also an add DBA server role member if you want to make me sysadmin or any of the other server roles. We also have the option to change things. So set DBA login. At a previous company, we had a ton of reporting services logins. Those passwords had to be rotated annually. That's super annoying to go through and type in every password right, and update them. But what we could do instead is we could use a random password generator. We could generate the password, set the password to the login, and then record it in the kind of secret management tool. right? So set DBA login. First of all, I'm going to use read host to get myself a new password. It's going to be real good. And you can see that the output of set DBA login says that my password has changed. Nothing else has really changed at this point. You can see it's not locked out. It's enabled. Everything's good. But this is not really any better than Management Studio, right? I did one login. I gave myself read access to one database. Like, 
meh, that's fine. But the power is that we can just iterate over things, right? So in this case, I'm going to import a CSV. And if I just run that bit, you can see that the CSV's got a username, a password, server database role. You can pass in multiple roles. This is plain text passwords. This isn't ideal in a real world environment, right? But what I could be doing, I could be using AD logins. I wouldn't need the password. I just have a list of logins. Perhaps you onboard 100 new employees every week, and they all need read access to this database. You get a list of them in an Excel spreadsheet. You read them in. You go through this. This is PS, uh, PowerShell 4 plus syntax, so I'm using the for each method. I have included down at the bottom uh, syntax if you're on an older version of PowerShell, but this is basically going to loop through that user's uh, CSV. For every user, it's going to connect to the server, create the login, so create the login, create the user in the database, add the role member. All this stuff is coming from the spreadsheet, right, or the CSV file. I'm just iterating over. PS item is like the item that's come out of the for each loop. So user, database, passwords, all in there. For role, you can see I'm splitting on the comma. So DBA tools doesn't want a comma separated string for that. It wants like an, an array, a list of them. So splitting on the comma, if there's two in there, it will pass them both through. If I run this. You can see that it runs over everyone, and it was super fast, but it's basically outputted the same thing we've seen, and all of those users have been created on my instance. This is super cool, because nobody wants to create new database users every week. Like, it's very repetitive. It's easy to mess up permissions, right? Forgetting to check one of the boxes, checking the database underneath instead of the correct one. This is a nice way of getting a spreadsheet with what you need, pushing it through, and making PowerShell do the work. One step further would be even to put this into some kind of automated onboarding process, right? If your employees get onboarded and they go through, there's some kind of process that builds them a laptop, creates them a login, add the permissions too while you're at it, right? As long as it's approved and you have the security process around it, there's no harm in doing this because someone's going to manually do it. You might as well automate it. So that is how I like to use DBA tools for security management. Ah. I mean, I don't think I've ever worked somewhere where I haven't had to add users and permissions to databases, right? So this is super nice just to make it easier. Questions on logins, access? OK, OK. So that was logins. Your next options are backups, migrations. Oh, boy, we're in trouble now. Best practices or documentation? Best practices, OK. We seem to be avoiding. They're not important. We're in the cloud now. That takes care of it. So best practices. Uh, with DBA tools, we have a bunch of test commands. If we run this, get command module DBA tools verb test, you can see all of the things that we can test. And this is basically that we're going to check on things, right? DBA tools being open source, one of the things I really love about this is it encapsulates a bunch of knowledge from the community, OK? Two of my favorites uh, we'll go through in a second. But people have written blog posts on best practices for years, right? And there are certain things that are agreed upon, and there are certain things that are not agreed upon. But some of the things out there, community experts, MVPs, folks from Microsoft have guided us across the ways, right? So we can test these things with some of these test commands. One of the things I like to check is the build. It's important to stay patched, right? We want to stay up to date with our, uh, with our CUs and with our service packs if we're still on an older version. We can use test DBA build for this. So I'm going to pass in two SQL instances. And I'm going to say, am I on the latest version? And I'm going to format a table just so we can see the results. I apparently didn't include the SQL instance name. That would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> this has been nothing but professional, mate. Uh, you can see I've got two SQL instances here. I've got a 2019 and a 2022, and they are, in fact, on the latest build version. It's actually a lie, because a CU came out for 2022, like between the last preview of DBA tools, which includes the build information. Uh, but 2022, this is the RTM version. But maybe I don't want to be on the cutting edge, right? Maybe I don't want to be on the very latest CU every time it comes out. Just in case Microsoft puts any, any issues in there, I'm sure they won't. But if they do, what we can actually do is we can specify I want to be 
within one CU. So this is going to instead test, if you check out right now the build level, build target, if I instead run that again, you'll see that the build target has changed. And it's actually gone down, right? So I now want to be within one CU. So if the latest CU is CU 17, if my instance is on CU 16, that's cool. I'm within one. I'm pretty, pretty patched up to date without being on the cutting edge. Where do you get the information about what's great, great question, because the next. What was the question? Oh, the question was, where does the information come from from what is the latest version? Thanks, Rob. I could have used you like 20 minutes ago, though. Uh, this is all built into a JSON file that's kept up to date by the DB DBA tools maintainers. And this website is also based off that J same JSON. So this is dbatools.io slash builds or dataplat.github. Uh, to get here, this JSON file is included in the module. So whatever vo version of the module you have has a version in there. Uh, if you do test DBA build and you use the latest switch, it will go out and try and retrieve the latest JSON file. So without having to update your module, you can still get that latest file. If you're on a, yep, a question from the back. How is the JSON file updated? Uh, the, how is the JSON file updated? Is this the question from the back? Uh, the, the JSON file is updated by the DBA tools contributors. Someone notices that a new CU has come out, and everyone races for the literally the easiest commit you've ever made to get a little star on GitHub. Uh, <laughs> yeah, of course, it's open source. And it's just a JSON file. Uh, it's actually in the, uh, in the bin folder within the module. It's just a list of all the versions. Yeah, do with it whatever you like. Um, yeah, and it's actually super nice because, uh, as we mentioned, people want to update this because it's easy. This is one of the, this is always up to date. Um, there's, a, there's been a little bit of a, a sketchy area while we're trying to get to 2.0 because development on the current stable version. Yeah, it is in here. You're right. So it's just my module that's out, to, out of date on my, uh, on my dev container. So yeah, you're right. Even though most development on, on the older version has stopped, this is still being updated. So we'll be in... in uh, yeah, and actually this website is super cool too because it's all... Filter, like you can filter, so like I only want to see the 2022 stuff. Uh, this is super cool. I use the website all the time too because I can't remember what the numbers are, like which one's 2022, which one's 2019, which pack are we on. Uh, this is a great resource for sure. Uh, so that link is in here as well, dbatools.io slash build will take you straight to that website. But as mentioned, it's just a JSON file in the bin. Grab it, do whatever pull it straight down from GitHub to get the latest one. You can also pipe straight to DBA, uh, test DBA build. So in this case, I'm just taking my two instances and piping them straight through. Super useful if you use central management servers or you have a list of database servers in a text file maybe or a database, just pull them out, pipe them through, filter for the ones that aren't patched, and now you've got a list of work to do, right? We can also check compatibility levels. So test DBA DB compatibility checks that the uh, question at the back. What's the compatibility level if I'm not a DBA? Great shout. So in our SQL Server environments, we have these major versions, right? 2019, 2022. The engine that's underneath that comes with a compatibility level. If I want to upgrade my SQL 2000 database that I promise I don't still have to something newer, I can keep it on an older compatibility level to keep most of the functionality the same. As I upgrade, I'm going to want to upgrade that compatibility level to get the newest features, the newest cardinality estimations, all the good stuff from the engine. But I can run older versions of databases on newer stuff. So for example, this Northwind database, the server level is version 150, so it's running 2019. But the database compatibility level is two versions before, uh, so version 130. And you can see that the server doesn't match the database, so it's come returning as false. You can also test the database owner. So every SQL Server database has to have an owner. Most people set it to something standard. Uh, in this case, I am testing that it's set to SA by default. It shouldn't be set to SA. But that was the default. You can actually pass that into. If so, I've got some that are returning false because they're owned by SQL Admin. What I can, in fact, say is actually in my environment, I want the owner, I think it's target owner. 
I missed the dash. Yeah, target login. So if I say I want it to be SQL admin, as long as you spell it right, you can now see that actually the results have switched. And my three databases that are SQL owned by SQL admin are now meeting the test, and the rest are failing. So this is configurable, too. Uh, you can go through here and change things to match your environment so you can test for what you're expecting. We can also test things like the recovery model. So in SQL Server, we can have our databases in full recovery, where we get that point-in-time restore uh, capabilities, or we can have them in simple recovery mode. This will check that the configured recovery module matches what is actually there. So you'll notice here that my pubs database is configured to be full recovery, but is actually in simple, which is not great. Because if I think I'm in full recovery, and I think I'm getting point in time backups, and I've got log backups, and I can roll back to any point in time, this one's actually in pseudo simple mode, because it's never had a full backup yet. I need to take that initial full backup to start the log chain. Now, one of the things I really like is this test TB, temp DB configuration. <clears throat> temp DB, there are all kinds of switches and things that you can do to make it uh, perform as well as possible. And if it doesn't perform well, it, it's going to hurt, right? So we want to make sure that it does. What is <laughs> Good point. Temp DB. Uh, I think it's described as like the public toilet of the database uh, system in the nicest possible terms. You can create temporary objects, right? Anything there on server restart is going to get wiped, so don't save your important things in there. Sorting. Sorting, spills for big queries, all kinds of stuff gets stored in there uh, in TempDB. So we want to make sure that it performs, because our big queries are going to use that. We're going to store data in there. Things should be a certain way. One of the things I mentioned earlier was this encapsulation of community knowledge, right? I can't remember all the rules for TempDB. There's loads of them. But this will go through and say, oh, your files should be created the same size. Are my data files the right size? Current setting is true. Best practice true. We're good to go. Have I set the max size? It's also recommended that you grow TempDB to the size you need and then kind of leave it. So it will check that. Do not place your tempdb files on the C drive. Oh, recommended false, currently false. Phew, we're good. What it doesn't know is it's running on a container, so it's probably just as bad as the C drive. But all of this knowledge uh, is kind of encapsulated, and you can use it. Obviously, don't just believe what it says. It's good to learn about it, right? But we've tried to add notes. Why is this important? To try and encourage the learning as well. Along those same things, we've got test DBA uh, max stop, which is the maximum degrees of parallelism, parallelism <laughs> that your query can go through. So if I've got six cores, do I want it to be able to use all six cores, or do I want to limit that? This uses calculations that uh, have been written about on this blog post that explain why it's important, why we should use it. Same for max memory. I can't remember the calculation to calculate max memory every time, but I know if I run test DBA max memory, it's going to take a look at the things that it can, can and notice I'm running on containers, so it's going to complain a little bit. But it's going to say, I've got four gigs, max value is three, recommended is two. I'm currently not meeting that max, that best practice, right? And maybe I don't change it, because I know that I only want max memory to be set like this. I've got an application that runs on there that this doesn't know about. But it's a good guideline. It's a good thing to look at. Man, that was a lot of checks, though. What if I want to check everything all at once? Well, I actually haven't tested this with the new DBA tools version. OK, we're good. <laughs> it is not the new DBA checks version. This is the old DBA checks version. But we have a kind of sister module, DBA checks, in the data plat repository that uses DBA tools and PESTA and combines them into this infrastructure testing framework, which is super cool. But basically, you can pass in some checks. So I'm saying database status, basically saying all my databases should be online and available. I'm giving it a couple of SQL instances. And you can see that everything is online and available. Uh, question. question. Yes. Great question. It does indeed. You can add in any of these checks. 
Yeah. So if I want to add in auto close to make sure none of my databases have auto close on, I can add that in and rerun it. And you can see now that I've got auto close being tested. Yeah. The, uh, the IntelliSense is really good for the checks. You can pull them straight in. Thank the bold man at the back. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, so DBA checks, obviously, we could have a whole session on that. We could have a whole day on that, a whole week on that, probably. Uh, if you want to know how it's built and the underneath of DBA checks, go to Rob's session. Uh, we are working hard to upgrade that to be compatible with version 5 of Pesta, which is going to make it faster, more reliable, better, overall awesome. But it turned out to be quite a lot of work. So we're getting there. Uh, DBA checks is definitely worth checking out. If you love the DBA tool stuff that you get and how easy it makes it to get information about your state, DBA checks is going to make that, that those morning checks so much easier. If you come in every day and you check all your databases are OK, just run this half an hour before you get there. Pop in, be like, oh, we're all green. It's gone into a database. It's gone into a Power BI report. You've got all kinds of options with DBA checks. Highly recommended that module. Cool. OK. Any questions on the best practices section? Oh, those lights are bright. OK. Now, although we did, we did say we were going to break the rules in the beginning, we did questions throughout rather than at the end, but Gail was stood there and he didn't yell, so it was okay. Popping back into the slides for the last couple of minutes, all of my slides, demos, everything is on GitHub. You can find me at jpomfret on GitHub. This DBA tools is the life hack session, and it's built inside a dev container. So you can pull down that repository. If you've got Docker, VS Code, and the remote... Okay, Docker or a, rel <laughs> a related technology like Podman, uh, the remote extension in VS Code, you can open this and you can run this exact de demo environment on your laptop. Everything I've done today has been within that dev container and that's all available on GitHub. Pull it down or in fact, even on GitHub, you can use code spaces. Uh, you can open it in the browser and run all these demos. This be the question and answer section. Anyone have additional questions about DBA tools, DBA checks, dev containers, life, proper football? The question at the back is how much of it will work with Azure SQL? Uh, so the answer is like pretty much whatever you can do in Management Studio. If you can connect to that database or instance with DBA tools, you can still use it against. Uh, Azure SQL. Obviously, Azure SQL database doesn't have all of the things that an on-prem SQL server does, so you can't check agent jobs because they don't exist. But if you can connect to it, uh, you can still use DBA tools to interact. And actually, a really cool function that I've been working on adding is uh, there's a GitHub repository called Azure SQL Tips for uh, SQL database that runs a bunch of checks. Uh, I've been working on integrating that into a command so you can run that against your Azure SQL databases and collect the results. So yeah, we do, we do work with Azure SQL. There are some restrictions, but yeah. I didn't hear that. Cool. The question from the back was, this was the best session, so thanks, Rob. <laughs> Any other questions? Thoughts on DBA tools? Going to take this home and play with it, work on this? Do you, do you have managed databases? Are you DBAs? <laughs> Two pointings and a shake. So someone was stood closest to the databases when they needed some love. <laughs> Welcome to the team. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, if there's no more questions, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, like I said, any questions that like you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, I want to know this, find me on LinkedIn. Find me on email. Uh, You can. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, we have a whole, uh, sorry, I have a whole course on DBA tools on LinkedIn Learning that you can go in and there's, a, I think I've got about five or six different modules on there uh, that you can watch videos of me talking about DBA tools. Because as you've probably guessed, I like talking about DBA tools. Is there, there is, but we're not allowed to talk about it yet, Rob. <laughs> 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 
There is a ne there is a next LinkedIn learning course. It is not on DBA tools, but it, it it will be out shortly. And actually, I'm pretty excited about it, but I can't specify the course name or when it comes out. But I can tell you that there's one coming soon. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Cool. The end. Also. Awesome.